Where the rubber meets the road, as they say, this is the practical side of eDiscovery. This is where I'm going to show you what the software actually looks like. Let's briefly review. I did the animation myself, by the way. And it matches the music. What we're talking about again in this EDRM model, this sort of accepted track of how you do e-discovery is on the left side of the screen, the early case assessment. You also heard it from the judges that were here on the panel. They want attorneys to get on top of this stuff early on in the process. Throughout the entire process, you have to bear in mind, keep in mind proportionality. What you're asking for in relation to the issues in the case and the claims, planning, is key. Planning this stuff out is always going to help. Remember the image from before of the hamburger buns in the hot dog bag. Bad planning. Didn't turn out so well. Working with your client. You cannot eliminate the client. In the past, paper discovery was different. They might give you a box or a stack of papers and you could look through it and do it. Now, you've got to interact with the client during this process and get them involved so they know what's going on, which is also going to help you with the costs because they'll understand what's happening and they'll know what they're paying for. Software is right in the middle, whoops, is right in the middle there as we talked about earlier. So let's see how this stuff really works. What are the mechanics? How are we really doing this? How do we get the data from the client? We are lawyers and paralegals. We're not IT people. How are we supposed to get this stuff from the client? It's a lot simpler than you think. There's two ways to do it, generally speaking, and it depends on the e-discovery software company that you pick, but you're going to do it by direct upload to the vendor, to the software company, or you could send it or have your client send it. Now, some of the software companies actually have the ability to remote in, in sophisticated situations, they could reach into your client's computer system and gather out the data and things, and that's where working with the software company is going to be helpful. But basically, it's as simple as working with your client's IT person who manages that data, either in-house or outside of the business, and saying, look, I don't need everything we're going to wind up paying huge amounts of money to upload worthless data. So we need to carve out a slice of this data based on custodians, based on time frames, based on email addresses, whatever you can come up with to kind of limit, reasonably limit down that data. And then you just upload it or have it burned to a thumb drive or disk or something and sent directly. Okay, so it's an FTP upload, meaning direct to their website. In the past, a lot of this e-discovery software was purchased, like the old uh, Microsoft Office or Windows, or, you know, not Windows, Word and things would be downloaded and it would reside on your computer and you have a site license for it. Now everything is migrated into the cloud. So uh, equally so, the software companies that service the e-discovery sector, they have migrated into the cloud. You can get some of this software and download it onto your computer, but why would you want to? You could be sitting right here right now or watching this video later and do e-discovery from a tablet literally on the beach. As long as you have an internet connection, you can access that data that is stored in the e-discovery software company's secured servers and be searching in it and using it and things like that. It gives you a lot of flexibility. So when you send the data, if you're going to actually send it to them and not FTP upload it, you're going to mail it away, they can, you can give remote access, they can access in through any number, like a, what's called a VPN tunnel and things. They, they can guide you and they can actually, actually access your client's computer. You can do it on an external hard drive. There are e-discovery software companies that will send you an external hard drive with software preloaded on it. And what you would do is plug it into your client's computer 
and that software on the hard drive creates a mirror image of your client's computer. So particularly if they're a business, you don't want this to interrupt them or disrupt their business. So you can have an IT person go in at night, they can plug this thing in, it makes a mirror copy of it. Now you've got that hard drive and you can send that off to the vendor or you can upload it directly. And of course you can always use mail, oddly that still exists. So what is the real difference between vendors? We looked at a screenshot of a few of these before. There are a lot. Like I said, there's kind of two categories. There's those that have licenses for older and original e-discovery software, like Relativity. That was one of the very first ones to come on the scene. They have sold, like Windows has sold licenses and things that people have added onto it. Relativity has sold its licenses and different companies will add their own bells and whistles on top of that Relativity engine that's running the searches. Other companies like Cicada have come up with their own. Which is better? Anyone? You're just, yeah, you said Cicada, but you're just saying that because you want another gift card and a prize. I could see right through that. It really depends on your case, and it depends on your needs and what you want. You've got to price this stuff out and see what is necessary. Do you need all the bells and whistles that your client is going to pay for, or do you like dealing with somebody who's independent? You can pick up the phone and call Connie. She's a lawyer. She's also in the tech space. She'll guide you through this stuff. Will you get that same service if it's another software company that just has a license and sort of layered their own landing page onto it? That's why you have to do the due diligence. You've got to vet these vendors. What do you want to look for? And as a reminder, the eDiscovery software vendor questionnaire is sitting on the website on the members tab for you to use. You can modify it, do whatever you want. It's a guide for you to use. What you want to look for and what you want to ask the software company is, do you have these features? Does anybody know what deduping is? Anybody want to take a guess? Yes, removing duplicates, exactly right. It deduping, that's what they call it in the industry. Because I send you an email, you send her an email, it's the same email, you've just forwarded it. But when you gather the data from your client, you've got two emails. You've got the original one and you've got the second one, but they're the same, it's just forwarded. Do you need to look at two emails that say the same thing? No, the software you can, you can break out the chain. You're saying, what if you need that to show it? You can separate it back out. There's no problem. But the deduping feature that's built into this stuff allows you to compress that down. When you look at the original, it's going to show you, hey, there's another one that comes after it that was forwarded. You don't lose it. But you're compressing it down, so you don't have to find, you've got 100 documents. Number 38 is the email that I sent. Number 72 is the forwarded copy. And you go, oh, I've seen that before. That's not fair. Yes, sir. Good question. Do they dedupe based on content or based on the source material? Generally speaking, as I understand it, and I did not design any of the software, so take it with a grain of salt, I think more often than not, the way that it's operating behind the, the scenes in that engine is it's using the hash value, which is like the VIN number for a particular document, uh, you know, for a car, and it's looking at this data. I think it also looks at the content data. Good question. If it's produced by PDF and the metadata is stripped out of it, then what do you do? That's where going back to how you request it becomes important because you might get to a point where you say, hey, I asked for this stuff in native format, you gave it to me in PDF, the reason why I wanted it like that was because I needed to dedupe it and things, and that's why the format that you request in the production request becomes important. Yes, ma'am, you had a question. Yes, I've been doing this a lot recently. I'm using ES Disco. Um, yep, Disco out of Texas. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and they've, They're in Houston. They've been very good. My other competitors, so I've published. Mm. You know, yeah, there, there are competitors. You can't mention their name. We'll <laughs> cut it out of the video. No, Connie. <laughs> Connie's not worried. What happens with deduping is huh? that the computer, now assuming that you got, that you extracted the ESI, you know, directly in it and it's, and it's uploaded to the platform, the computer uh, compares and will be able to tell that the, the two documents are identical. Uh, and so um, now, uh, but then it also creates metadata that will show how many, that there are 
two custodians for this particular document. Mm -hmm. And both of them will have a unique you know, hashtag value. And when you produce it, you can choose whether to produce two copies or just one. And then the load file that you, that you send over uh, will um, contain the information that, and tell opposing counsel that this document um, was, came from, that the same document came from two different custodians. Right, and, right. and yeah, and what so, you yeah. So what what happens is is that you know, say I, I send an email to two different people, then they've got two identical copies. But if it's been forwarded on, it becomes a different document, and mm -hmm. it's not, and, and it doesn't remove everything except for the longest thread. Yes, basically, you, what we're saying is when you dedupe this stuff, you're not losing the data. It's just compressing it and showing you there are other copies that were sent, and you can then make the decision: Do I need to break that out or anything like that? Culling is putting stuff in little piles, like we used to do with the paper copies, where you would you pull something out and say, oh, "Okay, I'm, you know, this part goes to this and this." It's just in a virtual world. Tagging is the digital equivalent of putting a little sticky note on it. Uh, sharing could be important if you have co-counsel or if co-counsel comes into the case. They could be anywhere in the world, and you could share the data with them, the searches, the results. You can communicate through the eDiscovery software um, and and comment to them on documents. You can add comments and things into it. The metadata and foreign languages. Foreign languages, it depends on, I think, the demographics of where you are, but it could be more important in certain places or others because you've got nuances involved in the language. And you have to know, can your software pick it up? But in early case assessment, you're going to be able to determine whether there are any foreign language uh, documents or emails or anything and know whether that's important. That's going to help guide you in choosing the actual software company. So what are some, we touched on this in the morning very briefly, but this is kind of the big three of the latest, greatest, newest areas of e-discovery. Um, and when we talk about, when we break them down and we talk about texts, the three items that you really have to kind of look at is preservation, because once those things are deleted, there's really no record of them. There's no um, repository for a lot of that stuff. It's usually residing on someone's phone. If they destroy the phone, they may be lost forever. Chain of custody. This is where somebody like Juan Peralta with eDiscovery Services is going to come in and be your best friend. Because if you can get the phone from the other side or even from your client to produce, and there might be some very helpful information on your client's own phone that is of benefit to your side of the case, you're not going to try to do this on your own. That's not what we do as lawyers and paralegals. You're going to call up Juan Peralta and say, what do you need from me and what are you going to charge me and what am I going to get in the end? And he's going to kind of guide you through the process or someone like him. That's why I wanted to have him involved with this presentation so you know there are people out there like that that can do it, that have that level of sophistication. So you don't have to try to take this upon your own shoulders. And of course, chain of custody and that stuff is important. And it's of great benefit that he is a Florida registered paralegal because he can speak to the chain of custody, whereas maybe others who are not who are technically competent but don't have the legal background, they might not be able to understand uh, to the level that he can the issues involved with preservation of the, the data for the chain of custody. And then getting it to the vendor. How do you get, okay, he's given it to you in some sort of a manner, uh, digitally or some kind of a little thumb drive or something like that. He's pulled this data off the phone. How do you get it to Cicada? That's where you call Connie and you say, hey, I have this data, this is what I'm looking to do, and they guide you through it so you can get it to them and then use the software to search through these tens of thousands of texts, let's say, that you would have. Social media is the next big area. Preservation, the conveyance to the vendor with a question mark because can the vendor even absorb this? Not all vendors can, not all the, the e-discovery software vendors can. So that's where you want to go through that checklist Use something like eDiscovery software reviews, or go out and talk to people that have used it in other cases and find the specific vendors that can ingest this particular type of data. Because you also want to know, let's say you call Connie at Cicada and say, hey, I've got a case that involves Facebook posts and images and things like that. Can you absorb that? She's going to say, yeah, no problem. But what kind of a file? What is the actual digital file of a Facebook post when you get the other side to download all their Facebook data from their Facebook account and give it to you as a file? Is that in the right format? 
Is that what you need to ask for from the other side? And that's where involving your software company and someone like Connie is of great benefit because they'll say, this is what you have to ask for. You got to tell them to put it in this format. So it'll go right into our software. And then of course the use, and there are ethical issues that we touched on earlier in the ethical part that you can't fake friend people in Florida to get their Facebook information and things, but oftentimes you don't have to go down those routes because you're going to have a friend of your client that has seen something on someone's page and they're going to know it existed. So you're going to ask for this stuff and then it's going to grow from there. And the evidence rules apply for the use. There's, there is no, no trick to it. It's still the same rules of evidence, best evidence, authentication, hearsay, all that stuff. When we talk about foreign languages, this is where we get into kind of a tangent because not a lot of people deal with it, but you don't just have the language. You don't just have the word. You have particular uses and the nuance for it. Um, water in Spanish is agua, right? Everybody remembers that from like grade school. What if the person who is emailing on the other side, let's say that you get this data or something, they're using that term agua, not to mean water, but they're using it in a different sense and they're using that as sort of a code word in a way. You're gonna search in the software and you're gonna put stuff in and it's gonna pull it up but you won't know how it's being used. So you wanna make sure that the software can find that the right way and what if, it, what if it's Sanskrit? Can you even search Sanskrit? What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's just a, the, the language itself, the, the letters involved in it are represented in a binary code. So this software with this algorithm built in is looking at it not like we see it with our eyes with the actual letter. It's looking at it behind the scenes in the binary code and it's reading that binary code. Whatever it means, you know, you probably have to get someone who speaks the language to come in. Um, but the software should allow for the identification. And to help us understand the nuances involved in foreign language discovery, I brought Mr. Chuck Norris. And there is actually a website called chucknorris.com. And they have all these funny little sayings. Chuck Norris can slam a revolving door. And it just, it just highlights funny little sayings, but it highlights the, the translation of foreign language and the meanings and the nuance in the software. And then my personal favorite is this one. Water gets Chuck Norris.